When two women are home alone, they hear someone rummaging in their backyard. When they go to confront the man, they find out he's on a mission from God. And then we take a look at a woman who encounters alien life in her kitchen. The conversation was going quite swimmingly until she asked the alien to move in with her. Today on Dead Rabbit Radio. Hey everyone, welcome back to another episode of Dead Rabbit Radio. I'm your host Jason Carpenter. I'm having a great day. I hope you guys are having a great day too. I got my haunted doll Veronica here. She's running co-host duties for us today. And let's give a shout out to our newest Patreon supporter, Corey Dennis. Corey, thank you so much for supporting the show. I always say it really, really helps out a lot. I mean it, guys. Like that, I feel like sometimes I'm just saying stuff like, hope you have a great day. Um, you don't have to listen to every episode. You know, I mean this stuff. I, I, it, it probably sounds like a chant. I do hope you guys are having a great day. And it means a lot when you guys support the Patreon. But if you can't support the Patreon, I mean this as well. That's okay, too. Just help get the word out about the show. That really, really helps out a lot. When I say that stuff, it sounds mechanical. But I want to let you guys know I mean it. Every single time I say it, you guys are so awesome. You guys rock. I I, I almost feel like my voice is getting a little emotional, but I want to let you guys know that. I do hope you guys are having a great day. I hope you guys know. I say it, I've been saying it for almost 500 episodes now. I truly, I am getting emotional when I'm saying this. I truly do mean it. I truly do mean it, guys. And it really, it's awesome when you guys support the Patreon. It's awesome when I'm online and I see other people talking about the show. You guys rock, dude. You guys rock so hard. Corey, let's go ahead and toss you the keys to the Dead Rabbit Dirigible. We're going up to Washington. A short journey from Oregon. We're headed right over the river. We're headed to Burien, Washington. This is actually an update to a story we did a while ago. It was episode 475. Would you test the devil's trap? In that story, we did something about Randonautica. About how these teenagers had found body parts in a suitcase out in uh, on the border of Seattle. Well, they've solved the case. I wanted to do this update. They've solved the case. There was actually two people, two dismembered people, in the trash bags in the big suitcase. It was Jessica Lewis, she was 35 years old, and Austin Winner, he was 27. Both of them had been executed. Both of them had been shot. Once they had the identities of the people, they could kind of figure out who it was. So... A couple weeks before these bodies were discovered, the cops got a report of gunshots fired. They they heard gunshots in this neighborhood. So the police went out there and people were saying the gunshots came from the home of Michael L. Dudley, a 62-year-old man. He was renting out a room to Jessica and Austin at the time for $1,500 a month, a room. But they couldn't pay it. Whether they lost their jobs because of the lockdowns, I don't know. I don't know what the circumstances were. But they couldn't pay it. Gunshots are heard in the area. The police go out there. They have to get a search warrant. And they go into the room. And they see bullet holes in the room. And they see blood. So Michael goes, oh, the blood was uh, the girl who lived here. She cut herself. She spilled blood. And they're like, okay, that kind of makes sense. But what about the bullet holes? And he's like, uh, (laughs) he didn't have an answer for the bullet holes. So the cops left. And then when, you know, a couple weeks go by, because what do you, you don't know. I mean, a big part of police work, a huge part of police work is the confession. I read so much true crime and it comes down to, do you confess or do you not confess? If you, you can get found guilty either way, just through a bunch of other evidence. But a lot of times it comes down to, well, we don't know. There's gunshots, there was blood. I don't know how much blood there was. The cops did say it looked like someone had been painting. So it's not like, like the cops are like, oh, well, I guess nothing happened there. They just didn't have anything to go on at the time. But when these two bodies show up on the seaside, they're able to actually identify the bodies. Then they go, where did these people live? And they find out it was this guy's house. He's been arrested now. He was charged with two counts of first degree murder. So at that point, so at this point, we're still, it's all alleged and everything like that. But interesting follow-up. In that episode, I thought, I wonder if they'll ever catch this guy. If those bodies had floated away, Because the teens were following the Randonautica app to there. The bodies had floated away. There's a chance that this dude never would have been caught. Because young people tend to be transient. It's easy to lose people. Lose younger people. But 
allegedly this guy murdered them, and um, hopefully he is, if he's guilty, if he's guilty, I mean, there's potential if there's gunshots in his house and there's bullet holes and stuff like that, but that is um, the follow-up to that story. So, Corey, we're to, we're, that's a sad story, but hopefully justice is done in that case, but it's awful. Um, we don't know the whole scope of it, but apparently they couldn't pay, so he shot him. Ugh. Anyways, Corey, we're leaving behind Burien, Washington. We are headed out to Union, New Jersey. Brrr. Still taking that dead rabbit dirigible, flying out to Union, New Jersey. It's January 7th, 2011. It's an early morning. There are two women living in this house, and they hear a noise in their backyard. A ruckus is what I actually put down in my notes. I mean, a noise is like a paint can getting tipped over. They're like, shush. Bunch of stuff going on. So they come out of their house. Again, it's super, super early in the morning. It's dark out. And they see their shed door is open. And it's like slowly going, <laughs> make it extra creepy, right? I don't know. Maybe maybe it was just propped open. Maybe there was a rock there. But in my version, it's all, and there's a crow. There's a giant black crow sitting on the shed. And they see stuff getting thrown out of the shed. And they're like, what? What's going on in there? And they keep walking towards the shed. And they're like, hey, hey, what's going on? They might have had more choice words to say. Because obviously there's a weirdo in there, right? It's not E.T. looking for something. Like, obviously, it's some dude rummaging through their stuff. What happens, though, is when they draw attention to themselves, a man jumps out of the shed holding a knife in one hand and, and not a bouquet of flowers in the next one, the hatchet. So the worst combination of weapons, right? Outside of a chainsaw and a lightsaber. He jumps out of there with a knife and a hatchet and starts chopping these two women up. They're completely defenseless. Like, you've probably figured at first the noise was a raccoon. Once you got out in there and saw stuff all spread across your lawn, probably figure it's a weirdo. But they weren't prepared for that. Their neighbor also hears the ruckus. So he's already outside and he hears the attack going on on the other side of the fence. He grabs a baseball bat jumps over the fence and just straight smashes this dude over the back of the head with his bat. Just like, pfft. Now, he lives, despite the sound effect I made, his head wasn't made of paper mache. He actually lives, but the assault has stopped. Let's go back a day. And then we're going to meet a man named Morgan Mez. He's 25 years old. And he's sitting there and he's like, oh man, I just woke up. Don't know what I'm going to do today. Oh, yeah, I'm going to smoke some synthetic weed. Remember when that stuff was super legal and you could buy it at the gas? This guy does. This guy totally does. But you used to be able to buy spice, like, at gas stations. He's sitting there. He's smoking synthetic weed. He smoked 15 to 20 blunts. So even he doesn't know. He's just ballparking it, right? That day, he smokes 15 to 20 blunts. And then the sun sets, and he's like, oh, dude... It was a really unproductive day. I better start doing some stuff. But first, let me smoke 15 to 20 more synthetic blunts. As he's smoking this stuff, he begins to think that he is a character in the Bible. So I don't know if like he imagined himself in like a coat of many colors walking around with a staff, or if he just imagined that he was in the Bible, he just couldn't find the right passage. He just thought he was some sort of biblical character, and he believed that God was giving him a mission. He believed that there were children being held in hell, and the portal was somewhere near him. He just needed to find that portal to rescue those kids. A noble goal, obviously. (laughs) Not when you're high on drugs. Like, obviously, if you are trying to save children, that's the most noble thing you can do. But again, like, if if he did go into hell and was fighting Satan... His reflexes might be a little dampened by the 40 synthetic joints he smoked. But anyways, he thinks the portal of hell is in these women's shed. So he breaks into the shed and he's moving stuff around trying to find the gateway into hell. And then he hears the people behind him and maybe he thought they were like archdemons or something like that. We don't know. Maybe he doesn't even know. He jumps out of the shed with an axe and a knife and starts... Or hatchet, sorry. He jumps out of the shed with a hatchet and a knife and starts attacking these women. Now... What was horrible was that these two women were so... They they both survived. They both survived. But they were so badly beat up by this attack, they were held in different wards of the hospital. They were a married couple. And each one of them thought the other one was dead. Because they were all slashed up. And they kept asking, how is she? How is she? In reference to her wife. And they go, oh, she's fine. She's fine. We, you just rest. You just rest. So she's thinking... 
oh, she's dead, and they just don't want me to know. And then when they go to the other woman, that woman's also like, how's she doing? How's she doing? Is she okay? And they're like, oh, just rest. So they didn't see each other for days. They thought the other one was dead, which would be a horrible thing to go through. They're fine now. They had to go through years of therapy and like physical reconstruction and stuff like that. And they were talking, they were like, if that neighbor had not jumped that fence, he would have killed both of us. There's no doubt in their mind. They're like, you can watch interviews with them. There's stuff in the show notes. They're like, talk about a guardian angel. It's so funny because if you think about it, this guy thought he was fighting the devil, but he ended up being the devil himself. And he ends up going to prison. In 2016, he's found guilty for two counts of attempted murder, 16 years each. In 2016. But this is this is the thing that always bugs me about covering these true crime stories. In 2019, he got the case overturned. What happened? This is how this is so insane. This is so insane how the justice system works. So he did three years. He did three years in prison for attacking two women with a knife and a hatchet. On the one hand, he might be totally fine outside of the mar- the synthetic marijuana use. Even back then, we didn't know how bad it was. You should. Any drug you can buy at a gas station, I think, is about as healthy as gas station food. But we didn't know full the full extent of how bad the spice stuff was. So I, mean, it, I didn't want... It's hard to say because you don't want the guy to go away forever because he was tripping on these drugs. But at the same time, he did three years. The reason why he only did three years was because the prosecutor presented evidence that they felt biased the jury. The prosecutor presented evidence, no joke, that made the defendant look insane. So the defense goes, but our, the, he shouldn't have been able to present that evidence. And the judge goes, you're right. That guy who attacked those women thinking there was a portal of hell, people shouldn't think he was insane. This was the evidence the prosecutor showed. The prosecutor showed that this wasn't a one-time thing. He loved smoking synthetic weed. One point, the prosecutor plays this video where the uh, guy, Morgan, was talking and he said, oh yeah, no, no, no. I've tripped out on synthetic weed before before this, before I attacked these people. One day, I almost attacked a five-year-old kid at a birthday party because I thought he was a leprechaun. And I wanted to kill that leprechaun because I thought he was like, (laughs) I wanted his pot of gold or something like that. I wanted my wishes. But I saw a five-year-old and I thought he was a leprechaun and I wanted to, quote, yoke up on him, which is beat him up. And the defense lawyer goes, he shouldn't have played that tape. The judge goes, you're right. That made him look crazy. So he got off. So because he appeared so insane to the jury that made the judge go, he's not really that insane, even though he said that he wanted to beat up a five-year-old kid because he thought he was a leprechaun. And this case was about a portal to hell. I don't know. But anyways, he's out now. And again, if he's clean, if he's not using any drugs and his psychosis only came from drugs, then maybe he should be out. Like, I, I definitely wouldn't want to take him to any birthday parties, right? I wouldn't want to dress up in a Halloween costume around him, but I'm hoping that he's better now. I'm hoping everything's better. It's just such a weird case, the fact that you could have someone snap like that and attack two women, but then it turns out that he didn't snap, that he was having previous delusions involving little kids and leprechauns. Is he still a danger to society? Is he okay to be free? I ha- didn't find any comment from the women after he was released, the story just kind of died down. It was big news at the time because it's kind of everyone's fear to just be brought up into a whirlwind of violence. It was truly a random act. How often do you hear a noise outside and you go check on it? You think maybe it's a raccoon. You think maybe it's a burglar or something like that. You never expect it to be a man dual wielding blades imagining you are what's preventing him from saving children from hell. Because he thought he was on a righteous mission. Nothing was going to stop him. He couldn't use that same defense with the leprechaun. He just wanted some gold in that case. But it's just scary all around. It's truly random violence against someone who believes they're on the right side of divine justice. Corey, let's go ahead and hop in that carpenter copter and let's talk about the movie the Vanished, new today on digital. Anne Heche and Thomas Jane star in the gripping psychological thriller The Vanished. Directed by Peter Facinelli, a family vacation takes a terrifying turn when two parents discover that their young daughter has vanished without a trace. Stopping at nothing to find her, the search for the truth leads to a shocking revelation where nothing is what it seems in this intense thriller. Own or rent The Vanished on digital today and watch it at home tonight. Rated R from Paramount Pictures. So I have four digital copies to give away. I didn't talk about that much on yesterday's, uh, when I was talking about it yesterday. I have four digital copies to give away. 
If you want one of these copies, I can't hold a contest. This is really weird. It's some YouTube rule. But if you email me, put it in the YouTube comments, Instagram, Twitter, just bring it to my attention. You want a copy? I'll pick people at random. Technically, that's not a contest. The contest, I need something from you guys, like personal information. However you guys contact me, just say, hey, I'd like a copy of that movie. And then at the end of the week, I'll just randomly pick four people. It was, it's, an, it's an interesting film. I kind of want to talk about it, but I don't want to talk about it now. I did enjoy watching it. I have a lot of stuff to say about it. So, but we'll hold that con. It's not a contest, sorry. We will hold that random selection. Just reach out to me in some way because I don't want to give them to people who don't want to see the movie, right? So, if you're interested in the movie, just hit me up any way you hit me up. I'll, I'll just pick names at random. So, Corey, let's go ahead. We are leaving behind the promo read we just did. We are headed out to Belarus, which is somewhere in Eastern Europe, I believe. We're specifically going to Vitbisk. Belarus. It's February 1990. It's 10.40 a.m. Helicopter is flying off. We see this town in the middle of Belarus. And then we're going to meet a woman named Nadza. She's a school teacher. She's getting ready for the day. She's making breakfast in her kitchen. Cooking up some eggs. Some bacon. (laughs) That's pretty hot for an egg, right? Eggs don't fry. I guess some eggs are fried, but... Pouring some orange juice. There's pulp in that. That's why it's making that noise. She's rolling some dice. Yeah, snake eyes. It's a bunch of sound effects just going on. There's a rooster outside. There's a small orb, though. (laughs) Despite all that. Despite all that. uh, This was the best sound effect. She's in her kitchen. And then... A little small orb floats into the kitchen. First instinct you're going to think is ball lightning, right? Which is super rare. Most people will never see it in their life. But at, looking back on this story, you could go, maybe it was ball lightning that was coming around. This was the size of a ball, and she said it was like a matte color. So kind of like, what is that, like a whitish clay colored? And it, she's just enjoying her more. It's 1045. Actually, it's kind of late to eat breakfast. But it's 1045 in the morning, right? She's not in the middle of nowhere. And this little orb is floating around her kitchen. It begins to circle her head. She's just perfectly still. She says it didn't say anything to her, but she knew what to say to it. It's kind of a weird thing. She wasn't getting any telepathic communication, but she knew what it wanted to hear. First off, she greets it. Thank you, Orb, for coming into my house. And I'm glad you visited our beautiful city of... And then she pronounces it correctly. And the Orb's like... She goes, I always knew there were other life forms in the universe. I always knew there was something else out there. And at this point, it's still flowing around here, and it starts a good zzz, 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 making crackling sounds like electricity. That sounds more like fire, but you know what I mean. You can imagine it. She says it begins to morph. It started off as a small ball, but it started to get bigger. It would become like a 19-inch ball, and then shrink back down to, say, like a golf ball, and then a big ball. A little ball, big ball, little ball. It's kind of going back and forth. And then tentacles start to come out of it. They came out to about eight inches out of it. She said it looked like a spiked mine. It's still kind of floating around her. She said when it would go back behind her head, she would feel a breath. She would feel wind on the back of her neck. It's still not saying anything to her. She's simply making responses to this thing. She goes... I wish I could go with you, but I have small kids. Orb's like, it's probably thinking, oh, lady, you're moving way too fast. I wasn't asking you to move in with me. Just wanted to float around your head a bit, dude. Slow down. Then she says, why do you come to me in such a strange appearance? And for the first time, it actually speaks to her. It's telepathic, but for the first time, it actually answers her. Because now she's asking it a question. It says, we appear in this manner. I don't know why. It has a posh British accent. Good day, lady. We appear in this manner because this is how we actually look like. And specifically visited you because we knew you would accept us as we are. That's an exact quote from this thing. She says she asked where it was from. This is an interesting detail. She said when she asked who where they were from, they said they were from a star system that started with an A. And when she's reporting the story, the 
reporter goes, well, which one? And she goes, I don't remember. Like, I'm not a scientist. Like, they just said a name. It started with an A. I don't remember it. That's an interesting detail because a lot of times it would be easier for her to make up the answer. Right? She could go, they come from the Andromeda star cloud. They come from the asteroid constellation. They come from asteroid M. Whatever it is, right? But she says it told her something and she heard it, but then she just forgot what it was. She goes, I know it started with an A, though. And then actually, I think at the time she realized she was a little out of her league because she asked, why don't you visit scientists? Like, why are you coming to visit me in my kitchen? And it said, the quote was, we specifically chose you because not all people are ready to meet us. That's something we've talked about a lot on this show, whether or not people are sometimes physically can't take alien contact. We've run into a couple stories where people have met aliens and then died of horrible diseases afterwards, or just not spiritually evolved or mentally evolved enough to see these things. So she's having this little conversation, though, with this alien. And then she says this, this very curious jump, because again, she's just kind of answering how she feels. She says this, this is a quote, if your spacecraft is crashed and you are in trouble, you can stay here to live with me. I have room for you, unquote. And at that point, the orb is still kind of floating around her head and it doesn't say anything. But she feels, for the first time in this entire encounter, pure fear overtake her. She says that she felt Like something huge was descending upon her. Just that weight of terror washing over her. Up until this point, everything was hunky-dory. She had no problem with this alien presence in her midst. But now, after saying, hey, you can come live with me, she felt fearful. She runs out of the kitchen. And when she comes back, I'm assuming eight weeks later, but when she comes back in, the orb is gone. So, when she asked it to come in and she felt something huge descending on her, was it simply an emotional reaction like the fear washing over her? Or was it something actually moving into her place? The aliens are like, what? we got a party pad, boys! Dun, 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 dun. Ship, invisible ship is landing. For the next six months, she said she suffered really bad vision problems and was also having memory problems. She couldn't concentrate. She was having all of these issues for about six months. And then they just go away. Is it possible that when she invited these aliens to come down, they did and just hung out at her place the whole time? They keep like every night, they're like, dude, you got to try out this alien martini. Glug, glug, glug. And she's like getting blitzed and dancing all night long and stuff like that. And then she wakes up the next morning. She's like, what? I don't remember last night. She's just, there's like alien Mardi Gras beads everywhere. They're holographic beads. She's like, what? What happened? Her visions, all her vision problems are because of alien strobe lights from partying all night long. We don't know, but for six months, she was having a hard time remembering stuff. She was having vision problems. And then those go away. After that, she becomes incredibly lucky. It says in here, usually is the word they use, but usually whatever she wanted, she got. Now, that's an interesting side effect. We can almost read it like this, that She did invite the aliens down, and immediately her human instincts told her, oh, whoa, you shouldn't have invited it in. That's a very common thing with with mythology or with, um, I don't know if the right word would be mythology. Folklore is the word I'm looking for. You invite the demon into you, you invite Dracula into your house, or any vampire, not specifically Dracula, but you invite these things in. She could have invited in this alien force and her raw reptilian brain, not alien reptilian, but evolutionary reptilian brain, told her to flee. Something bad was going to happen. And for six months, they did inhabit this place. But to pay their rent, to basically pay for all the trashing they did of her place, it was in the eighth dimension, so she won't notice it. But the the house in this realm is totally normal, but like if you go over two dimensions, it's just completely demolished. The alien's like, oh man, this totally wrecked this place. They pay her back, by giving her good luck. That's an interesting trade-off. Would you take six months of memory and vision problems? Would you take six months of alien roommates, basically? <laughs> They're just constantly floating around your head. You're like, dude, I'm trying to read a book. They're like, uh. They flo- There's a, like 10 of them. You can't see any. Maybe that was the vision problems. Maybe these orbs kept floating around in front of her. She couldn't necessarily see them. <laughs> but somehow they messed up her vision. I don't know. I'm pulling that one out of my butt. But my point is, is like, if you had 10 orbs... Ten alien orbs flown around you, whether or not you could see them, they're probably going to make it a little hard to read TV Guide, right? These orbs are flowing around her head. 
what's creepy about this story, other than the fact that she had alien roommates for a couple months, is the story ends with this. It says that the last thing the aliens told her was that they were returning for her in five years. Now, that's out of the narrative. That's an interesting thing, because the orb didn't tell her that. Remember, the orb that was floating around her didn't tell her that. She said the last thing the aliens told her was that they'd come back for her in five years. So, did the aliens move in with her for six months, and then before they left, they're like, we'll be back for you in five years. And she's like, what? I thought you guys were gone. And then she starts getting incredibly lucky. That's how this story ends. This is one of those stories that took place in 1999. I I got it from thinkaboutitdocs.com, so they have it sourced on there. And it was um, from a newspaper called Yaroslav UFO Center Number 6, which was published in 1993. So three years after this event, this story was published. We don't know what happened at the five-year mark. They said they're coming back for her. Now, we see that a lot, again, in UFO lore. A lot of times aliens say, well, we're coming back. And we never really know, for the most part, unless it's somebody who's famous or a story that happens quite recently or people who are reporting it 20 years later and they're like, they said they'd be back in five years but they never showed back up. A story like this... Five years later, she may have had her roommates for six months, and then they told her, hey, we're coming back for you in five years. She's incredibly lucky for a period of time, and then she just goes missing. Her kids come home to a house one day. Mommy, mommy, sorry, that's super disturbing. Super disturbing. No, we're orphans now. Aliens are like, your mom's on the party barge with us now. Mom's all dancing, go-go dancer in space. That's depressing. I don't want to end it. With kids, kids crying for their lost mom. That's a sad way to end the episode. So we don't know if she actually disappeared or not. That's one of those things. We don't know if the alien ship came down to get her. We don't know. We don't, we pushed Corey Dennis on the ship as well. We're like, your Patreon set up to auto pay, right? He's like, yeah, why? Uh. But he's also now up there partying with Nazda and a bunch of aliens. He's like, no, I'd much rather be on Earth. Small sacrifices, my friend. We need you up there to show how great humanity is. You know what's funny? Because I think... That that's what this story really says. Not that we're pushing Patreons to be kidnapped by aliens, but humanity's superpower is our humanity. Like, we are, at the the core level, humans will help out people in need. We can have national rivalries, we can have religious rivalries, political rivalries, sports rivalries. They're usually less intense, but... You know what I mean? In America, at least, Britain, it seems to be pretty nuts. People are beating each other up. But you know what I mean? We have these rivalries. But at the end of the day, when something bad happened, if a rival sports team had like a collapse of their stadium, you will run out there and remove that stuff. Just like the neighbor in the first story, right? I don't know if they got along. They could have been best buddies. They could have just been a neighbor who heard two women being chopped up. What do you do in that moment? Without seeing the threat, he grabbed a bat and jumped over that fence. We help each other out, regardless of what's going on. I know it doesn't seem like it. I know it seems like everything is more fractured now than it has ever been. But at the end of the day, we love each other. I 100% believe that. And here's the thing. If we don't, if things keep getting worse and we become more tribal and more separated from each other... It is not going to end well. I think we love each other, and I think that when the rubber hits the road, we have each other's backs. However, you could also definitely have a future where everyone has a knife and a hatchet. And the reason why I have my knife and my hatchet, because that guy has his knife and his hatchet, and I can't put mine down because he's going to kill me. And that guy's thinking, well, I got to hold on to my knife and my hatchet because if I put mine down, that guy's going to kill me. We're looking across that divide, that artificially inflamed divide. You can have divides between cultures, between religions, but when you let it get inflamed, you let it get infected, the divide is no longer just, oh, we have differences of opinion. The divide itself becomes the overriding issue. Not the fact that we have differences of opinion. It's that gulf that just gets wider and wider. If it does go that route where all of us are holding that knife and that hatchet, it's we're in for a really dark time. Not only on this planet, but if you are a peaceful, loving alien species, you're not going to want to land here, right? You're not going to land here. We have this story of this woman who invites him into their house. Those aliens are like, hey, they're not so bad. We like crashed and she invited us into their house. We only talked to her for like a couple minutes. The next thing I know, she let us 
party at her house for six months. And then you have some great alien being like, oh, that's not what I heard about Earth. Because the last time one of our ships crashed in Roswell, two of them died on impact. The third one, they dragged off to some base and dissected them. And they showed the footage on Fox. Earth is nuts. I'm not going back there. So if we're not, if we have to be, the humanity being humane is our superpower. It's that brotherly love we give out to each other, and we should be putting out into the universe as well. Because what's going to happen is you have peaceful aliens being like, screw that place, dude. You have one mechanical malfunction, they chop you up. It would be the equivalent of if you're on a plane and it crash landed in Kentucky, and they're like, well, plane was supposed to go to Chicago, but <laughs> we're going to dissect you because you, you weren't supposed to be here. Like, that would be it on a galactic scale. And the peaceful aliens are going to be like, dude, they're always chopping us up. They're shooting us down. And even if they don't shoot us down, if our ship just crashes, they cut us open. Peaceful aliens aren't going to want to come here. Because we're holding that hatchet and that knife. So who will end up coming here? An alien species with a bigger hatchet and a bigger knife. We get from the universe what we put out into it. I honestly believe that. And if we put out love and understanding, if we let it emanate from our core, so not only can other humans see it, but the whole galaxy can see it, we are going to attract that back from the universe. But if we put out fear, the universe will respond in kind. The universe will send us an alien species that will show us what the true definition of fear really is. DeadRabbitRadio at gmail.com is going to be our email address. You can also hit us up at facebook.com slash DeadRabbitRadio. Twitter is at DeadRabbitRadio. DeadRabbitRadio is the daily paranormal conspiracy and true crime podcast. You don't have to listen to it every day, but I'm glad you listened to it today. Have a great one, guys.